Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. This is Roger Gilbert, and I'm in the Rongo Rongo Live video studio this afternoon, reporting for Milling and Grain magazine. It's a pleasure to have with us today uh, somebody uh, who is familiar with uh, sustainability and uh, the impact it might have on our industry. And that is David Nicholl. He's the Vice President of Sustainability and Business Solutions at DSM Animal Nutrition and Health. Uh, David, uh, welcome uh, to Rongo Rongo Live. Yeah, thanks, Roger. Pleasure to be here. Well, David, uh, it's very interesting to have you on the program, given that uh, earlier this month we had the COPE 26 meeting here in Glasgow, in Scotland, actually, and the outcome of that. But before we get into that specifically, I understand from a sustainability response, uh, DSM has introduced an initiative called We Make It Possible. Uh, can you give me a quick recap on, on what that is in terms of sustainability? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Roger. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, so for DSM, you know, sustainability is really our DNA. It's who we are as a company, very much a purpose-led company. We have been that for many, many, many years, you know, doing well by doing good. And, uh, and we translate that into our We Make It Possible uh, strategic initiative. We're focused very much around six key platforms, which help uh, the transformation of the animal protein business to a more sustainable footing. And um, basically, uh, to summarize, we, we focus on, as I said, six key areas. One is about tackling, helping to tackle uh, antimicrobial resistance, so the big societal issue of, of the rise of antimicrobial resistance, helping the industry trans, transform itself and shift away from uh, antibiotic use or limit its use um, and, and use of alternative technologies. Secondly, we look at reducing our reliance on marine resources. That's a big, big topic for aquaculture, of course. Aquaculture is, one of the, for many, it's a, it's a primary protein source, animal protein source uh, for many in the world. But of course, there's an over-reliance on marine ingredients in many cases. And so, again, developing technologies to help that transition to a more sustainable future. That's the basis of our, our joint venture with Avonic, for example, our Veramaris business that we've developed. And also why we uh, we venture in, for example, areas of single cell protein with companies like Deep Branch. Um, thirdly, we look at um, making efficient use of natural resources. It's very much about getting more out of less. I think we're all aware of the need to to use more local raw materials in our feed, and the feed which is going into uh, into feeding animals. Of course, uh, there's big debate about land use change, the use of over reliance on things like soy and, and, and corn and what have you. Um, and so we've we invested over the last 20 years in, in for example, the feed enzyme business, you know, and developing everything from xylanases, phytases, sort of proteases, where you can extract more nutritional value out of, out of raw materials. Really important, of course. Um, fourth, of course, we look at um, reducing livestock emissions. You would have heard a lot about um, developments we've made in reducing methane emissions from ruminants. Um, I was talked a lot about COP26, you would have, we can talk more about that later. But it's not just about methane reduction from the ruminants, it's also reducing, for example, nitrogen and phosphorus emissions flows into the environment. These are kind of key drivers of, of, uh, of biodiversity change on land and in water. And therefore, how we're developing solutions to reduce the amount of nitrogen flow. So how do you get to a low protein diet? get more out of the protein that we're putting in the diet of the yeah. animal, reduce the amount of nitrogen going to the environment. Really important in many parts of the world, as, you, as you're fully aware, Roger. Um, the fifth area is about um, reducing the loss and waste in the system, actually. Um, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of animal protein that is produced is lost. 20% uh, of meat uh, is, is thrown mm. away, 35% of, of seafood. So how do you improve that? You know, that's again, looking at um, bringing nutrition, you know, good nutrition into the feeding of animals, improving the inherent quality of the animal protein itself, okay? extending the shelf life and what have you. And last but not least, it's about extend, it's about, well, it's the, the lifetime performance of animals on farm, particularly when you talk about areas like dairy nutrition, you know, keeping the cow on the farm longer, making yeah. the animal much more productive, yeah. etc. And so, you know, complete programs in, in terms of a much more much more productive farming system. And 
What's really important, what we notice is, is that, you know, the footprint of animal protein, uh, about 80%, up to 80% of the footprint of animal protein is due to the nutrition. Okay, so this is the crops coming off the field, the use in the, in the, in the feed itself, and how the animal then uses that, that, that feed, um, how it turns out into protein, and of course the manure uh, coming out of the animal. If you're not addressing that through nutrition, um, to fun, you know, bring in functional nutrition to get more out of less and be much more, much more uh, efficient and productive in the system, then uh, then you're really not going to make a difference. So that's where we focus. Um, that's where we have our competence, and that's really the essence of of our program. We make it possible. Well, that's a quite a comprehensive overview. And what springs out at me is that this is not just a sector or segment by segment approach to sustainability. It's a, it's encompasses the whole of the the protein food chain, as it were, from growing yeah. the crops for the animals through to not wasting uh, that end cut of beef or whatever it is you're consuming. So um, how do you get that message across? I mean, do you do you have to break it up into segments, or are you are you promoting the the global approach. Of course, it's um, it's highly nuanced depending on where uh, you are in the world, which species and value chain that you're operating within. Um, for DSM, we actually operate from farming, you know, the animal farming, all the way through to the human nutrition side of the business. So we're a completely integrated player along the value chain. Yep. So we're talking with the farming groups all the way through to the CPG companies, you know the consumer packaged goods companies and the retailers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what you're noticing, particularly um, with the whole drive to decarbonization of value chains, is you get down down the value chain, you know, to the big, big companies, and they're looking up towards the farming, their supply chain, and looking for solutions. You know, so they want to see the complete kind of solution, not just a one product, one fit kind of approach. Mm -hmm. You need to take an ecosystem approach. You need to understand the consequential impact of the technologies you bring to, to the customer. You have to help them transition to their, their type of reductions. So for example, if you look at the dairy industry, you know, as you, you probably would have read, you know, the global dairy platform, the GDP, sets, a, sets an, uh, an ambition of net zero by 2050. But before 2050, many of those big dairy companies are setting targets for 2030, typically 30% mm. reduction in carbon emissions by, mm. by then. Uh, but how do you then get there? And they're very much looking for the complete program. Okay, mm -hmm. what happens is, okay, improvements in animal productivity, you know, reduction of direct methane emissions, uh, all the way through to improved um, or to reduction in, in loss and waste in the system, and very much depending on what type of product they are then processing, whether it's a, you know, liquid milk, cheese, or, or yogurt, what have you, they have different solutions to improve processing efficiency. And all of that combined, course gets them to where they need to get to um, in terms of producing products to the consumer that's low carbon or towards their net zero goals. Mm. So we, we talk to the value chain. Uh, every value chain is different uh, and therefore you need to have a set of solutions that fits uh, and is relevant to that, uh, to that uh, value chain. Do, do you think that our government, our respective governments, understand the complex nature of this reduction in carbon that that involves the whole of the chain rather than just look at farmers or aquaculture in isolation that's a very good question it is a very complex topic of course and um but i think there's a general understanding that it is about the, the, the decarbonization of the value chain and there's multiple players in that um, it's not just on the lap of one person or one part yeah. of that value chain. Um, I think the, you know, obviously, if you're looking upstream from a from a big CPG company, then about 70 to 80 percent of your carbon footprint is coming from your supply, your supply of animal protein. Okay, and that's mm -hmm. normal for any business. It's your upstream suppliers that are your your, your main carbon uh, sources. Um, so obviously. There's a lot of focus on how can we, on the one hand, understand what is the, yeah. the footprint of, of farming, and that is highly nuanced. Mm. You know, there are some extremely low, low, low uh, footprint uh, producers of animal protein, uh, and, and also quite the opposite. But you need to understand and measure 
and baseline where those producers are, and then bring forward solutions that fit or improve that footprint. So by using really advanced footprinting techniques, technologies, you know, full life cycle assessment, you get to understand exactly what's going on on the farm, uh, where to make improvements and how to make those improvements using proven technologies. And then most importantly, that are easy to implement. You know, it does not result in a major capital expense for the farmer, for example. Yeah. Um, and they, that, that, them, that they themselves have a positive return on investment for the farmer, mm. you know, improving productivity, for example. And so you get that win-win. As a sustainability uh, vice president, um, do you ha do you connect with people outside your organisation? By that I mean outside your customer base. I mean, is there, uh, for example, would you have been at COPE 26 if it was appropriate? Or do you have like similar um, meetings or groups or activities where you can exchange these views? Yeah, of course, you know, you, again, taking a, a complete ecosystem approach to, to, to this, then you need to be meeting with various stakeholders. You, you get outside of your immediate industry. Um, so you'll see the increasing um, uh, focus from the financial institutions, for example, mm. on where is the climate related risk. The banks yeah. are very interested in understanding what is that risk on their balance sheets. Um, the insurance companies are starting to look at what is insurable and what's too risky. Um, you've got the uh, ESG investors, the rise of the ESG investor groups, looking at where they place their money and wanting to understand what is the risk in, in, in farming and, and uh, what is uh, acceptable risk or, or not, who has plans in place, for example. But you also engage with NGOs as well yeah. um, and other, other bodies. Uh, and, and I think it's really important that uh, by doing that, you, you imp increase the awareness and understanding of, of the topic, that it is complex, that there isn't just this average kind of animal production uh, concept around, you know, and I think that's one thing the industry struggles with, that everybody's, everybody's painted with the same brush, yeah. and it's not like that, you know, and, uh, and I think it's really important that we get those those messages across, we get the facts across to all these, these these different stakeholders and that they really understand and appreciate what the industry is doing. Mm. And, and you mentioned there, which uh, is interesting, uh, and my next question about measurement, um, you know, before we can actually bring about change, we should measure where we are. Now, um, in sustainability terms, who's measuring what? Uh, is this just down to the fa farm level measurements or is should everybody be measuring? Well, ultimately, yeah, what, what you're doing is you, you want to measure the complete system, ideally. So if you're trying to say, if you're trying to measure what is the, the footprint of a kilo of meat, and that's the functional unit you're measuring, right, a kilo of meat, then you need to understand what are the inputs coming from the crops of the field, as I said before, how that how that's to, you know put into a into, into a ration, into feed, how the animal is consuming and digesting that and, and turning that into protein, what comes out in terms of manure. So everything in the farm. But then the animal leaves the farm uh, and that goes through the processing part of the chain all the way down to packaging and onto the shelf. And so the what we call the system boundaries go from one end right the way down to the other. And you need to measure, be able to measure the whole, whole process. And only by doing that can you really understand what's going on, uh, where to make improvements, or where you don't need to make any improvements because things may be really good. Uh, and, and then you have the complete view. Uh, and that's, that's, what's, that's what's needed. And you need to do that in, in completeness. It's not just about carbon food. It's about mm. the full environmental footprint. Um, and typically we, we, we measure in 19 different dimensions, you know, so you're covering the complete environmental footprint of that kilo of animal protein. Mm. And do you think we're on, on target to meet our goals, uh, the UK goals of zero emission, not zero emissions, but zero uh, in, improvement or uh, increase in our footprint? Uh, by is it 2050? Is that achievable in agriculture? 
I, I think um, you, there can certainly be some major improvements made. The technologies are available in the industry, um, and, um, and they've been around actually some of these technologies for some time. Um, I, I think the key thing, going back to measurement, is if you measure, then you'll understand exactly where you are. Okay? Mm. Um, uh, and then you can use these proven technologies to make significant reductions. We, we see double digit reductions. Uh, that are achievable in many of the animal protein supply chains. Um, but of course, you know, you can only do so much. And we, we firmly believe in in reduce on your own, in your own business, right? So you take the measures that make those structural changes that actually reduce your footprint. Uh, measure that accurately, incredible measurement, uh, CA tools. And then often you'll find in many industries, there's probably a gap to close. And it's maybe very difficult to close that gap. And that would then come down to uh, buying, for example, in the case of carbon, carbon offsets with a credible system, of course, right. to get down to net zero. Mm. Okay. Net zero. But uh, mm. I, I think the, the more we get into the detail, the more we see how nuanced this is, um, mm. how some parts of the industry are already very well advanced perhaps not recognized as much as they should be, um, then I think there's, a, there's a, you know, a lot of positive notes we can take away here, but there's still quite a lot of work to be done. Mm. Uh, David, uh, we were speaking earlier on just briefly about COP26, uh, and it reminds me that you know, this is quite a significant event uh, globally when it comes to, uh, not, we're not just talking about sustainability, but about climate change and uh, reducing uh, CO2 in the in environment, etc. Um, did you have much involvement there? And did that have much significance to what you're doing now? Yeah, thanks, Roger. Yeah, in, in fact, COP26 is a very important, um, important meeting, of course. And um, as a company, we were certainly present. Um, and a, a very important uh, point to discuss was the impact of methane emissions on climate change. And it's now well recognized. In fact, prior to the COP26, the most recent IPCC report highlighting the issue of methane emissions uh, and that uh, immediate action needs to be taken to reduce these, uh, these uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and and a, a major proportion of that is coming, of course, from livestock, from ruminants, yeah. from uh, dairy and beef uh, cattle. And it's an area that we as DSM have been working on for many, many years. And developed transformational innovation, which is called Bovair, uh, which reduces methane emissions from beef cattle by up to 90% uh, and uh, a minimum of 30% in dairy cattle is receiving enormous attention um, from governments and industry worldwide. Um, and when you start to see at COP26, you know, over 100 countries, nations signing up to reducing methane emissions by 30% by 2030, then it's this type of technology that is really going to help that transition happen, bring it to reality. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's good news for, for the dairy and the beef sector in that they can, they can make a, a significant reduction in their carbon footprint. So it's, a, it's an area which is uh, something we've been very much involved in driving for, for many years. Uh, we also announced um, that we will be building uh, uh, more facilities up in Scotland uh, for the production of Bovair uh, for, the, for the industry worldwide. Oh. So yeah, it was a, a very significant event for us as, as a company doing that technology. So. And, and you mentioned Scotland, of course, but uh, what other countries recognise the issue? Uh, are you? Are you getting your message across to the dairy industry and all these other countries? Yeah, we are. We're engaged with the dairy industry worldwide and all the significant uh, uh, dairying uh, countries. Um, but as, uh, as you may be aware, um, the EU itself has a, has a methane uh, uh, strategy in place and how to reduce methane, likewise the US. Mm. Um, but uh, countries uh, that are major, majoring in, in ruminant uh, business, whether it's dairy or beef, are very aware of, of, the, of the topic. Yeah and uh, very much looking for solutions to, to make that reduction possible. And yeah. uh, Bovair is uh, recognised as a leading solution. Um, oh, fantastic. And, and has a, a peer-reviewed research behind it, you know, which, mm. which uh, elaborates on the topic. Yeah. And, and did you find uh, much uh, recognition by the group itself uh, when it comes to beef and uh, dairy that uh, 
a significant reduction can be achieved? I mean, did the whole COPE26 group understand what what you're suggesting or what, you, what you're developing? Yeah, I think there's a, a, a general acceptance that there are technologies now uh, coming to the market to help this sector uh, reduce its footprint. Um, and um, many, many uh, uh, solutions coming, as I said, to the market, which have been reviewed by the scientific community. Um, Bova have been highlighted as the leading one in that regard, um, in terms of consistently reducing methane emissions from dairy cattle um, and beef with about four, up to 50 peer review publications. Uh, a lot of science behind it and recognition worldwide by, um, by uh, governments, the scientific community and by the, the, the value chain as well. So yeah, it's well known, um, and now we're getting the uh, the registration is now coming into place. It's registered for use in Brazil uh, and, and Chile, and um, EFSA in the European Union has just uh, given a positive opinion about it. So we expect to have that uh, available for the, for the European market uh, very any time soon. So it's really good news, I'd say, for for this part of the industry. Mm -hmm. Well, that's excellent. Thank you very much, David Nickel. It's great to have you on the Rongo Rongo Live uh, video studio. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you back uh, when we've made greater progress in this direction. But uh, good luck with uh, We Make It Possible in uh, 2022. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, the anniversary of your first year of that program initiative. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Roger. Pleasure being here. Bye for now. Thank you.